Optimization and the Intelligence Explosion. Boy, this one is a tour de force because it ties together a few concepts that I think are so profound and so underappreciated. Even in the discourse today when everybody's excited about AGI, I think so few people are grasping these basic building blocks that you can see Eliezer bring up again and again in different posts and tie together. And these are kind of key to his mental model and key to the discrepancy between the Doomers and everybody else, it seems like. Uh, so, optimization processes, what are we talking about? It's basically hitting an improbable target relative to your preference ordering. So if I want to build myself a vehicle, if I just smash a bunch of atoms together, I'm just not going to get a good vehicle, right? It's not going to have a high speed, it's not going to get me where I need to go, it's going to be low in my preference ordering. But if I build a car, you know, how did I find that car? How did I get there in concept space? Right? It, it took an optimization process to get there, some sort of process, some sort of algorithm that's able to search this complex combinatorial space of physical designs and get something that has the criteria that it can transport me quickly, comfortably to where I need to go. Right? So my brain would be an optimization process with respect to the problem of efficient transportation. Okay, so we all know human brains are an optimization process. That's fine. What's the point of this definition? Well, if you look at natural selection, right, the process that builds animals, it's the same type of process. It's also an optimization process. So there's a deep connection on the level of this abstraction of an optimization process that you can say not only is the human brain an optimization process, but our creator, our god, natural selection, the thing that built the animals, it was actually optimizing the animals and the plants for the criteria of inclusive genetic fitness. So just like our preference might be get me from A to B comfortably, Natural selection's quote-unquote preference, the target it's trying to hit, is genes that are good at reproducing themselves and increasing their frequency in the population, right? And that's a non-trivial optimization challenge, right? If I show you some animal and I'm like, improve that animal's genes so that their genes are better at getting to reproduction, right? Survival and reproduction and increasing frequencies. Uh, you know, it takes intelligence to do that, and or at least by definition, it's going to take optimization, right? You can't just randomly mutate them, right? Mutation's not going to do the job. You also need natural selection. Natural selection is a way to select on the genes based on which ones work, right? It's a process of scaled up trial and error combined with mutation, and it's kind of a dumb process, and yet, with sufficient scale, it does the job of optimization. And it's smarter than a lot of things, right? So there's a lot of animals that... Uh, you know, like a beaver, it can build a dam, but it can't optimize somebody's genes. So the fact that a natural selection is able to go around optimizing our genes, it's pretty impressive, right? And, and even creationists, right? There's that argument, the blind watchmaker argument, like, hey, I pick up a watch, I can tell that that watch is designed. Hey, I look at a bird, I can tell that the wing is designed for flying. Okay, it's not designed, but it's optimized, right? So the creationists were correct to notice that something about a wing is different from something about a rock. A wing in a rock is very different. It's clear that the wing only exists because it flies, right? There's, there's no other way to explain the wing. I mean, you can go really low down to the level of atoms, but you're missing something very important about the wing. So similarly to the watch, like when you pick up a watch on a desert island, you really can conclude that if it wasn't designed, at least there was some optimization process, right? That's like a legitimate insight. Okay, so the concept of optimization process is letting us make a deep connection between the human brain and natural selection. And it's also, you can include animal brains as optimizers too, right? I mentioned a beaver. So a beaver can in fact optimize a dam design. It can't really optimize transportation design. I don't think beavers really build themselves rafts. They don't build airplanes. So we can start to compare and contrast different optimization processes. And there aren't that many of them in the world. You've pretty much just got animal brains, human brains, natural selection, and now you've got human software, right? And that's pretty much it. Like there's not that many optimization processes. Okay, let's look at how powerful different optimization processes are. The thing to note about natural selection is that while it is an optimization process itself, it wasn't produced by an optimization process. It was bootstrapped, right? So natural selection only began by a coincidence because passive processes spit out the first replicator, right? It could have been like a cycle of chemicals, like RNA molecules, 
uh, you know, precursors to cells, whatever it was, there was something that was able to mutate and be selected on, which then bootstrapped the entire process of evolution by natural selection. Uh, but natural selection was not built, it was not optimized, it just kind of plopped into existence. The same way that the first replicators just kind of plopped into existence, right? Very bootstrapped, very uh, low grade, right? Very dumb processes here. Uh, now, over the years, natural selection has had a few upgrades. Uh, as more organisms got built, as more DNA designs got built, it opened up different regions of the space to search from, right? Because natural selection is kind of a gradient descent. So the more places you wander, the more niches you hit, the more genotypes you have, the more it opens the door to wander more, right? So you can um, you can build up optimization that way. Um, the invention of DNA separated from proteins and RNA. So now you have a more uh, abstracted, encapsulated layer that you can do the optimization on. So that can make the process of uh, evolution by natural selection more efficient, take less time. Uh, and then you have sexual recombination, right? So you've got more mutation in natural selection per generation. And that's pretty much it. Those are pretty much the only upgrades that we've had to natural selection. So at the end of the day, here in 2024, natural selection is still pretty dumb, right? Like it can't look ahead and ask what would happen if I do multiple mutations at once. It kind of has to get lucky and try them all, right? And that's why it gets stuck in local optima, right? So if you've ever seen, like if you look at the design of the human eye, there's like that nerve cable that basically is installed backwards, right? Where I think the, the nerve comes out of the retina and then goes back in the retina and creates a blind spot, like completely insane design, right? But natural selection is just forever going to be too stupid to realize that there's an obvious optimization to that design. Whereas if you use a human brain, you can look at the design and you can be like, oh, okay, that is a design mistake. We can do better, right? So natural selection is, it's okay, but it's pretty dumb. And humans are basically smarter. We just haven't had as much time to do the optimization. We haven't had as much scale yet. Okay, so natural selection was bootstrapped. Um, now, if you look at the animals, animals have always been targets of optimization. So they are themselves optimized, but they are also not very good optimizers, right? They lack generality as optimizers, whereas natural selection, it does have generality because it works using physical consequentialism. It plays out the consequences of all of its designs. So anything that can physically happen is something that natural selection can quote unquote reason about. It can be part of the feedback loop of natural selection because physics will play it out and it can decide whether the organism lives or dies and so it can make it into the next generation it, it can produce information basically about about whether any design is good whereas like a beaver is not going to be able to evaluate different dam designs you know it's not going to be able to say hey what if i you know add wings to the dam like the beaver just doesn't operate like that right it, it uses algorithms that are just like pretty dumb they're not like fully general searchers of the space of possible dam designs uh, so natural selection has a generality property that animal brains don't tend to have. Uh, and then also natural selection has cumulativity. It's cumulative when it builds up. So when it builds up a gene, it doesn't have to create the gene again from scratch. It kind of saves its work with each generation, right? Now there's plenty of gene designs in history that have been forgotten, but today we have a big library of genes that are still around that it can work from. So that's pretty good cumulativity. All right, so that's natural selection. It has generality, it has cumulativity. Um, and we can look at the human brain. The human brain also has generality. We can pretty much think about anything, or at least anything natural selection can think about, but we can think about anything in the domain of physics. We can even make up hypothetical universes. We're Turing complete. So it seems like humans are fully general. Uh, humans have cumulativity because language, culture, we can, now we have writing. So we're very much competitive with natural selection, right? We just haven't had enough time. But we also share a, a fundamental weakness that natural selection has which is the distinction uh, between like kernel mode and user mode, right? So, you know, we can't directly optimize ourselves. We can only uh, optimize upon other things. The same way that natural selection doesn't really naturally select natural selection. It doesn't really build natural selection. Um, it, it doesn't say, how do I make another process that's going to make genes fitter better than I can? It doesn't think that way. Um, humans can potentially say, how do we make something better than humans? But that would kind of kick off the next phase. That wouldn't really be humans anymore. That's what we're doing now with AI. We're saying, hey, let's just build a different optimization engine. Um, but that is going to be fundamentally different from us because it's going to be able to optimize itself. It's going to be the first time that you have an optimization process that it was optimized itself and it can optimize other things. And there's not really a distinction between uh, kernel mode and user mode, 
right? There's not a protected level. Like humans, for all the optimizing we do, we're still running on the same brain that was optimized by natural selection, not by humanity. Whereas with an AI, its code, sure, the version one will have been optimized by humans, but all the future versions can just be modified copies made by the AI itself. So it's the first time that the distinction between optimizer and optimize kind of breaks down, and it's just kind of this one positive feedback loop, right? It's like this one physical process that it's hard to predict what will happen when every time it figures out how optimization should work better than the nature of what it itself is kind of instantly changes, right? It debugs itself. And humans are pretty bad at debugging ourselves. Like we notice biases in ourselves or we notice some properties that make us less smart than our smartest scientists, right? The fact that I know I'm less smart than Einstein, that's great, but it doesn't let me go and tweak my brain to actually be as smart as Einstein, right? The, the present state of the art in rationality training is not sufficient to turn an arbitrarily selected mortal into Einstein, which shows the power of a few minor genetic quirks of brain design compared to all the self-help books ever written in the 20th century, right? So we can't do it. Like there are known biases, right? There are ways that I know I could be smarter if I have a little bit more short-term memory, right? A little bit better visualization. If my parietal cortex worked in a fourth dimension, that would help me with a lot of different types of math, right? Quaternions, right? Linear algebra. I could do so much if I could just upgrade my, the modalities of my thinking. Um, and, and just like, you know, have fewer biases, um, you know, maybe a better work ethic, right? Just more energy, relentless energy, uh, focus. So I already know a bunch of ways that I can improve myself and that's just scratching the surface, right? That's without even being super intelligent. That's just to make me as good as the smartest and most productive humans. Okay, so recapping, um, when we have AI, AI will be an optimization process. It'll have generality, it'll have cumulativity, but for the first time, it'll have a feedback loop through the meta level, right? It'll have self-modification or the ability to create new copies instantly and that'll make it fundamentally different from humans. It's very much sparking a positive feedback loop. And people say, well, don't you know the economy is growing exponentially? Yeah, but that's always happened with a fixed level of optimization driving it, right? The exponential growth of the economy, yes, there's some economies of scale, there's some positive feedback coming from the economy itself, but there is a constant background uh, optimization power behind it, right? You've never seen what happens when the positive feedback loop also amplifies the optimization, right? So this is absolutely unprecedented. So the lens of optimization process really helps you appreciate the phase that we're about to enter because people ask like, why do you AI doomers expect a foom? Like it's like such a weird sci-fi scenario. And I'm saying like, no, it's not weird sci-fi. If you looked at what happened in the last few billion years, the fact that natural selection kicked off on planet earth the fact that humans got kicked off among the other animals, these are crazy sci-fi developments on planet Earth, right? So when AGI comes along and it becomes this new positive feedback loop because of self-modification, Foom will not be like this new, crazy, unexpected thing. It's very much in line with the changes that the universe, this section of the universe has seen over the years. Like this is very much a, a simple trend extra extrapolation. Foom is kind of the normal case. Expecting a non-Foom scenario is kind of the weird thing that requires extra justification. So yeah, check out the article, Optimization and the Intelligence Explosion. And there's a lot of different threads we can pull on, like we can dive deeper into precise definitions of optimization and um, and things like, okay, why would it have an ex intelligence explosion, right? Why would it be so motivated to optimize its intelligence, which is basically instrumental convergence? So there's a lot of different threads to pull on, but just the fact that Eliezer has this laid down like 15 years ago, uh, these really important mental models, I just hope that people start thinking this way. All right, that's all I got. Uh, let me know if you have any requests for other sequences posts you want me to riff on.